Good morning. Wow, I'm listening to that 1.28 million, 2.5 million, 1.8 million, and uh, I recognize that public art is serious business and that those kinds of investments are the kinds of investments we need to create these sorts of legacies in public art, no doubt. Um, the cultural capital year had a, a total budget of, well, we received two million from the city of Calgary to get started. And we were able to turn that into almost six million through combination of public funding and private funding. And uh, out of that, about 70% of it went into the hands of artists and cultural workers in the form of grants or artist fees. So I want to talk a little bit about that because it's a different world when you're dealing with this kind of money and also when you're talking about the soul of the city and public art and how do those intersect in, um, in, in a celebration like the cultural capital celebration. So um, when we were asked to come here and do the soul of the city, when I was asked to come here, I was really excited about it because certainly when we were named the cultural capital of Canada, it was as if uh, the doors were opened and the soul of the city just rushed right in. So I have this kind of advantaged uh, perspective working for Calgary 2012 where I get to see the soul of the city and its many, many incarnations every day. And I think that we hear constantly that that soul is getting stronger and that we're getting more aware of how much there is to do, see and experience in Calgary every year. Our role, primarily where it comes to professional artists and arts organizations, is as a funder. So I want to share with you a quick story about how that's realized through a cultural capital celebration such as ours in Calgary. So it starts with um, funding for something like Nuit Blanche Calgary, which we provided seed funding for for this important public art festival to get started in this year. We weren't the only funder by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that it's fair to say that because we were a cultural capital this year, that seed funding was available when it otherwise would not have been for this festival. We also provided a direct grant for BGL to come here with this work carousel. So that was an artist import-export um, contribution. And then we provided a grassroots grant for Kaylin to buy light bulbs for this piece cloud, which was part of Nuit Blanche. In total, the cumulative investment that Calgary 2012 was able to make in Nuit Blanche was our biggest investment in any arts organization during the cultural capital year. We did it because um, there was a lot happening in a range that fit all of the programs, but also it's a fit for the look and feel of what Calgarians told us they wanted to celebrate in their cultural capital year. They wanted to participate, they wanted to start things, that were significant in the city, and they wanted to contribute to leaving a legacy on some level. I will say that it was worth being a donor, sponsor, and partner with this organization through and through. I'll also say that this organization intends to continue for many years after 2012. And so I would encourage those of you that are in the room that have the ability to invest in organizations like this to consider um, continuing that legacy with us and finding ways to come and make investments in really important activities such as this. So we invested in Nuit Blanche, that gives you the kind of range, but really we started the year saying this is about telling our stories. Every Calgarian has a story to tell. So with the cultural capital, when we talk about telling our stories, we start with our professional storytellers. So in that way, we had a project grant and we asked artists to come forward with the types of projects they might like to do in the cultural capital year. Back to the budget issue, I mean, we're talking about grants that max out at $20,000. So it's almost impossible to build a significant piece of legacy art on that kind of a budget. But we have a lot of public art and a lot of public art projects that came forward. And I'm just gonna run you through a few. So there are projects like this one. This is Dean Stanton at the Strathcona Christie Aspen Community Association doing a mural. That's what you would consider, I think, probably in your mind for a, a, a public art project, murals and things like that that exist in community spaces. But there were also projects like this one. This is Daniel Kirk's Cavernous Isolata 3, where Daniel was um, in this Lucite box for five days on Stephen Avenue Mall. And he created 
a 360 degree um, work of art on the loose side over that time. He didn't leave the box. And certainly for Daniel, there's a legacy here because this work actually achieved an incredible amount of press and media attention for him. And it told something about Calgary. This is uh, Jesse Gochi's work. It's called the Johnny Crow Film and Mural. So the process here is that this wall gets overpainted several hundreds of times and photographed in order to make a stop motion animated short film. So you might be familiar with um, Jesse's other works, A Spirit of the Bluebird most particularly, that's gone around the world in small film festivals and large film festivals as a short work. So you can see that the end result is a mural in the Ramsey community that sits as a legacy of the work, but also there's a resonant result of a film project that travels around the world out of Calgary by this artist. And then finally, I really encourage you to uh, head over to the Calgary Municipal Building, where, and I'm sorry my Icelandic isn't very good, but I'm gonna give it a shot, <laughs> where uh, Hekla John Studier, do you know? Am I, am I in, everyone, even in the neighborhood, but yep. <laughs> great. So um, this artist actually has a full exhibition at Truck Gallery right now, but through the cultural capital, we were able to support this installation work that's in the Municipal Plaza building of City Hall. And we were also, just to finally say, able to support the container project, which ended up at the very last minute being very generously cited in the East Village. So just as an example, this is a, a work that's a piece of public art in and of itself. It's two shipping containers. Inside, it's a screen for uh, dance. This whole site was populated by shipping containers which had interiors that could host performance and exteriors that could host performance. And then more than that, um, it's put together by Springboard Dance and during their fluid festival, this was really became a meeting place and a nexus. So when Eve's talking about um, the Ron Moppet work and the Julian Opie piece, you can see that those kind of pieces create a place that is significant and it stands to be a legacy for the long term of what that kind of place is. And these kind of p pieces fill in that soul, right? So if you're gonna have a place that's gonna have these significant works of public art and be a destination, what happens in that place? How do people come to that place? How can you continue to work with um, creative landscapes in ways like Container does to bring community vibrancy to the space? So we did fund about uh, just, just under 200 different projects by artists and arts organizations. That's a few that touch on public art. But more than that, when we put the bid out to be the cultural capital of Canada, a lot of people said, we really want the opportunity to be exposed to the creative process. We want to create, but we also want to see how work is created. So I would say that putting artists in public places is an important part of what public art does. And when you explained the process, Eve, earlier, um, it really helps to build an appreciation for what these pieces are that we would walk by every day when we have an understanding of the process and the person behind the work. So we have uh, 30, I think it's 34 artists in residency. It's over 800 days of residency activity in the cultural capital year this year. Uh, we have residencies in places like the Calgary International Airport. When you think about the airport, there's tens of thousands of people that go through the airport every day. Um, this is Eric Moscapetis and Mia Rushton. They're working on a project where they interviewed employees at the airport, and then they took snippets from those interviews and they created them into these uh, fabric quilt works. Those quilts then get gifted to the employees, and then Eric and Mia as artists can borrow those works back for a long-term exhibition project that they're working on. The interesting thing about this is not just that it happens in an airport where you wouldn't expect to see two artists working on a quilt-based project, but also that the Calgary Airport Authority supported this. So our artists and residents receive an artist fee for every day that they work. They receive material fee, and they also receive a fee for workshops and exhibition related to their residency. So the Calgary Airport Authority contributed $20,000 to have Eric and me in the airport working, and they've been there for a couple of months now. Uh, this is a more traditional residency. It may not appear that way, but <laughs> 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 
more traditional because this is the Ladies Invitational Deadbeat Society, and it's traditional in that it's <laughs> taking place in, a, in an artist-run facility. So this is a John Snow House, which is run by the New Gallery, and, uh, and, and it's a place designated for artists to create work. But you can see that they're really coming out of the confines of the house itself. <laughs> We also saw a straight creation-based work. So this is Kim Cooper and the Decidedly Jazz Dance Works dancers creating pieces inside the Calgary Tower. So they would be working sometimes with five or six dancers. She would be working sometimes with five or six musicians and dancers, creating work in the atmosphere of the Calgary Tower. So it's a chance for people to, um, the, the audience is not necessarily influencing the work that's being created, but they're able to watch the creative process that's influenced by the space. We have a Francophone Artist Laureate. Her name is Mireille Perron. She's a very talented visual artist, and her piece as Laureate is to work with French language schools to come up with a list of words that are used in both the French language and the English language with different meanings. Then that final list of words she turns into a series of etchings. The school that she works with gets the full series of etchings. One etching gets displayed publicly in a public space in the school, and then the school gifts the remaining of the series into their community for public display. So you can see in this case, it's an artist that's working directly with the community to actually create the work, but then the work itself is a piece of public art that actually has an ongoing resonance that follows the meaning of what, it, of what the work is intended to do, which is bridge our understanding between French and English artistic cultures. And finally, and this is probably the deepest we got on those kind of creating those intersections that you create when you have artists in residence. So the artist here is Dick Averns, and he's standing beside Ed Whittingham. So Dick is the artist, Ed um, is, I think he's the CEO of the Pembina Institute where Dick was resident artist. And so Dick's project was driving 90 kilometers an hour as performance art. And so <laughs> Ed's project is talking about the environmental impact of driving 90 kilometers an hour. So how do these two people start to influence each other? So what is Dick? perspective as a conceptual artist bring to what Ed is trying to do as an advocate in raising awareness? And how do they intersect and work with one another? So it's what Dick is doing is performance art. It happens in a public place. But much more than that, it's the intersection between public and the artist, what the artist brings to the public perspective and vice versa here that's really evidenced. And one of the things that have come out of this is that um, Dick has actually authored some uh, writing about his conceptual practice that's part of the Smarter Driver Challenge report that Ed is producing for Shell Canada. So you can see the kind of line that's being drawn there. So traditional kind of art in public places, directly through granting at small levels. Artists in public places creating work in those intersections, all the way to community public art creation. So we're probably getting about as far from the very significant legacy of public art infrastructure that Eve was talking about at this point. So is this public art? Sure, this is public art. This is the Canton Alley, and this is the Canton Alley mural project. It was created by um, students at a summer camp where they were learning traditional Chinese brushstroke techniques and history, which then became this mural. The mural. If you haven't been to these alleys in Chinatown, I'd really encourage it. It's taken basically service alleys and through a mur several mural projects has created a really livable space that's now a home for celebration, community gathering. Is this public art? So this is um, Calgary Catholic Immigration Society brought uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks in to do a sand mandala. So it's creating art, visual, I would say visual art, although there's a depth to this that's more related to spiritual process in a public space in a temporary way. What it's intended to do is to engage community, and I think the picture kind of says it all. Is this public art? No, this is not public art. <laughs> I, you know, it's not visual art, but this is the uh, Battle City 2012. So this is four quadrants of the city that did breakdancing challenges that met in the city center to do a break off. But the interesting thing about it is it's a lot of collisions. 
So you're talking about four quadrants of the city, you're talking about multicultural expression, you're talking about an art form that's both recreation, dance, music, and I would argue aesthetically visual sculpture in a lot of different ways. So I think that we can kind of think about the soul of our city as having that range of artistic expressions right down to this kind of a thing that happens that tells you something about Calgary and who we are and what our soul is. And so what I would say is that as you as a Calgarian or a business leader or an artist think about your place and the contribution you're gonna make, also think about you in your neighborhood. So we funded um, Find It Calgary and if you know uh, Inglewood Ramsey at all, there's a ton of artists living in that community. And uh, I just want to say, it's a, a small grant to do pop-up stuff in the neighborhood, all of which in many ways is related to public and art. So Sam, here you are <laughs> at the 23rd <laughs> Avenue Art Fair. <laughs> yeah, um, and, uh, and then, uh, so a lot of artists living on 23rd Avenue and that yeah. were able to show and exhibit on a pop-up art fair. This is the Ramsey movie night at the Ramsey Rink, which was a lot of local short films and musicians. And, and then a reading. So this is in front of Rosemary Griebel's house and she's literally reading from her porch as part of a pop-up. So there's the trajectory of public art as we celebrate our cultural capital. Um, I wanted to just point out that we have a few board members in the room today. So Lois Mitchell is our chair and I can see Amanda Koyama and Luke Azevedo is on our board as well as many members of the Calgary 2012 staff. So please feel free to ask us anything you'd like about the cultural capital in general afterwards. Thank you very much.